the prophet Jeremiah stood in the gate of Solomon's temple and proclaimed those words that we heard. And in the last week in the life of Jesus, Jesus stands in the gate in the courtyard of Herod's temple and proclaims these words. Listen now to the word of God from Matthew chapter 21, beginning at the 12th verse. Then Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. This is the word of the Lord. Well, religion has its critics. Some years ago, against my better judgment, I decided to bone up on recent criticisms of Christianity. And so I read some of the best-selling modern critics. They gained popularity as the so-called atheists, the new atheists. I read Sam Harris's The End of Faith and the Future of Religion. I read Richard Dawkins' The God Delusion and Christopher Hitchens' God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. The titles alone are enough to give you heartburn. <laughs> well, the critiques are not as new as they like to think they are. They've been stated in other ways down through the centuries. And when I finished all these books, I found myself wishing I had spent my time better cutting the grass or taking a nap. Well, if you're looking for something to criticize in the church, here we are. We provide plenty of raw material. I don't like the coffee at coffee hour. I don't approve of the decisions the session made. I'm not so keen on the worship service or Bible study or the way we have our building open or not open. Uh, there are other people occupying my space. Not too keen on this new carpet. We've hidden the fact it's new for months. <laughs> I don't like this light. What is this all about? And last of all, serving roast preacher for lunch. <laughs> Friends, criticizing the church is like shooting fish in a barrel. <laughs> it's easy to do. But the harshest critics of religion are not found in the so-called new atheists, nor in the pews, but in the Bible itself. There are no tougher critics of religion than the prophets and Jesus. Jeremiah and Jesus were fierce opponents of the practice of religion because they knew just how much was at stake. For faith Faith is a demanding business. And to practice a vital faith means engaging the, the heart, the mind, the soul, the hands in motion and putting the shoulder to the plow. Now why is Jeremiah so hard on the people of Jerusalem about how they're practicing their faith? Jeremiah says that the temple in Jerusalem will be destroyed if the religious people do not change their ways. But the very idea of the destruction of the temple is anathema. It flies in the face of the common belief that the temple will stand forever. And as long as the temple stands in Jerusalem, God's in his heaven all right with the world. The words of Jeremiah grate on the ears of the priest who control the worship of God. The words of Jeremiah defy the teaching who that the temple is the presence of God. He breathes treason to the king by undermining the civil religion of the time that knows as long as the temple is there, the nation is secure and safe. Jerusalem will never fall to its enemies. Well, 500 years ago, this very year, Martin Luther knew how much was at stake when he posted the 90 five theses on the Wittenberg church door. He called for a debate on the sale of indulgences by which a person could, in a sense, borrow, buy um, 
years out of purgatory for their sins, purchase relief for their punishment. Luther believed that the church was erring in selling what God has freely given. The sale of indulgences, although quite effective in raising funds to build a beautiful St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, undermined the true faith of God, true faith of God's grace, and God's free gift of repentance for sin. Luther sought debate and reform, but he started a revolution, a spiritual and ecclesial revolt. And posting the 95 theses on the church door was as risky as Jeremiah standing in the temple gate and preaching this temple sermon. Well, like Luther, Jeremiah is calling the people for a total transformation of civil religion. He wants to stop people from thinking that of the temple itself as a kind of visible symbol, a talisman of security for the nation. Jeremiah mocks the priests and the people as they, they gather for worship and repeat, repeat in their liturgy a kind of mantra or phrase, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. They put their trust, he says, in the Lord, not in bricks and stone or incense and sacrifice or in word and song, but in the Lord. In the Lord who calls them to practice justice, to care for the foreigners among them, to protect the poor, to stop hedging their bets by worshiping other gods as well. In short, if you listen to the words of Jeremiah, he's saying to them, hey, friends, keep the commandments. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in my house which is called by my name and say, we are safe. Well, what's wrong with the way they understand their faith? They sever the connection between religion and daily living, between worship and moral behavior, between obligations to God and obligations to the neighbor. Jeremiah is not saying that faith is nothing more than, than good behavior or a set of rules to follow. Oh, no. But faith in God, nurtured in worship, leads to a faithful life in how we live with one another. We cannot separate our faith from how we run our businesses or live in our families or use our money or provide for the poor or seek justice for all. The most effective evangelism, faith sharing that we can do is to live our lives in such a way as they see Jesus reflected in us and in our life together as Christ's body. That they see coherence between our practice of worship and our moral life and compassion in the community. But you know, sometimes we go even an additional step in misusing religion. Jeremiah criticizes the people for not only misusing and not living their faith, but also for using the faith as a smokescreen to cover their sin, their moral corruption, their greed and injustice. Did you hear Jeremiah ask, has my house become a den of robbers. And when Jesus enters the temple in the last week in his life, he is distressed by what he sees. And many commentators down through the years have said, well, here's the problem. Jesus is criticizing the money changers for cheating the people when they exchange their Roman coins with Caesar's image for acceptable Hebrew coins to make their sacrifice. Others say that Jesus is angry with the business, the business of the temple when the vendors are cheating the people, when they come, the poor, to, to buy their dove for the sacrifice, they overcharge them. Well, they say that Jesus and Jeremiah are simply criticizing the corrupt practices around religion. Well, that may be true. But there's more to it than that. 
Stop for a moment and think about what a den is. A robber's den is not where thieves go to cheat, steal, commit their crimes. Oh no, a den of thieves is where robbers go to hide, to seek comfort, to eat, drink, to be merry, to count their loot, to tell their stories. In other words, religion has become for the people a facade, a false mask, a front. God's house, intended to be a house of prayer for all people, for all nations, has become a safe house for robbers. And in their criticism of the practice of religion, Jeremiah and Jesus do not pull any punches. They do not soften the blow. It is hard to hear because we know how to wear a mask. We know how to put on a good front. We know how to use religion to hide the truth about ourselves. And when we come to worship and if we are unrepentant of our sins, the evil that we have done, the unjust ways that we have treated others in the community, the denigrating words that we have spoken against other religions and people who are different from us, the bullying we have done or tolerated at school, the hatred we harbor in our hearts, the selfishness that too often marks our own thoughts and actions. We are treating God's house as if it were a den of robbers. For what we do, what we say, what we think in the name of God matters. Matters not only to God, but to our community and our world. The words we speak and the way we live together and the ministry we extend to the community can be an expression of true or false religion. We do not come into God's house just to feel good about ourselves and condemn others or to whip up anger against those people who are different from us only to, to bless ourselves and excuse our own shortcomings. The Word of God convicts us and calls us to a deeper faith and to a higher standard of integrity. We come to worship the living God in this place so that we may go into the world as a people of justice, truth, and faith. The rural church that we served so many years ago did a wonderful job caring for one another. You should have heard them sing the old-timey hymns and songs of the faith. It was great. They really got into it. They loved gathering together and doing projects that, that helped the church, you know, clean up, painting, fixing, repairing. These were good and kind folks. But outside the church, summer migrants lived in deplorable conditions and camps. And good Christian folks acted if saying racist things and comments were acceptable and treating some neighbors as less than themselves was okay. So one day when a member brought up the idea of, of the congregation hosting a, a refugee family from Southeast Asia, the uproar was so strong you would have thought that somebody came in and burned down the church. For what was the church for? To support one another, to help people feel good about themselves, to maintain the status quo. But not the church of Jesus Christ. For Jeremiah and Jesus make a clean sweep of the practice of religion in order to unleash the power of faith. We come to worship not to have our prejudices blessed, not to care only for ourselves, not to reassure ourselves that somehow we're better than all those other people out there. For a closed mind and a cold heart, are not godly things. And so we come to worship to, to open ourselves to God, to invite the Holy Spirit to work in us, to begin to see the world and to see other people from God's point of view. We come to worship, to confess our sin and our brokenness, to experience God's grace and to be transformed by the power of God to live a new life 
in the world that God so loves. So who are the critics of religion? Who are the harshest critics? In a way, this Lenten season, may we become the harshest critics of ourselves so that the truth of Jesus may live in us and the light of Jesus may shine through us. Amen.